So I start the recording. So welcome everybody. Today's um, speaker is uh, Dr. Noah Kurinsky. He is from uh, Fermilab. So uh, Noah graduated from the Tufts University with a degree in engineering physics and astrophysics. He obtained the PhD at Stanford on working on uh, CDMS, cryogenic matter uh, search experiment. And then went to uh, Fermilab as a Leatherman Fellow, where he became involved in the QIS RD. Starting um, in September, he will be a staff scientist at Slack. Uh, and uh, so a week, a month for his relocation. <laughs> and uh, where he's going to start a new lab on quantum sensing for uh, dark matter uh, searches. So, congratulations, first of all. And we are very happy to, to have you here discussing the quantum sensor for detection of sub, sub GEV um, dark matter. Thank you, Noah. The stage is yours. Thanks. Thanks, Sylvia. <clears throat> yeah, so <clears throat> as Sylvia said, I'm, I'm sort of at a, an interesting phase of my career, and I, I've done a bunch of stuff recently. And so now I'm, I've been spending some time trying to get a broader view of you know, where we go from here to figure out what I want to do next. So I'm going to sort of talk about three different things, um, kind of with an eye on getting people up to speed pretty quickly on what's going on in the dark matter field. Um, talking a bit about what we're doing now in, in actually it's, you know, Super CDMS HVV, which is the next generation of, of Super CDMS beyond Snow Lab, um, and then future prospects um, for just more um, research oriented directions that could lead to uh, larger dark matter searches down the road. <clears throat> so given that this is a seminar and we don't have five hours, I, I, I kind of want to let's start with some assumptions. So I, and I'm going to take in this talk that dark matter exists. Uh, dark matter is particle-like in nature, um, and that it can be produced in the early universe, so, so that we, we can basically use that as a clue as to what dark matter may or may not be. Um, we're going to assume it has roughly the kinematics of the local stellar neighborhood, and that we roughly know what the density is. So th those sound like a lot of uh, uh, assumptions. Those are, you know, each of those can be a talk in themselves. Um, but if we take them as, as, as givens, um, it, it does give us a little bit of a roadmap for how we go after different types of dark matter. Um, but in this talk, we will not assume that dark matter fits into specific theory. So I'm not talking uh, about WIMPs or axions or anything in particular. I'm just talking about dark matter generically. And when we look at certain mass ranges, then we can talk about which theories might fit into those mass ranges. And we acknowledge that the universe might conspire to make dark matter undetectable, but that would be very sad. And so uh, while, while that's true, let's, let's, let's assume that it's not until proven otherwise for now. So this is a, a, probably a familiar diagram to many people who, who've been studying dark matter for the last couple of decades. Um, but the idea with, with dark matter searches is that we know if dark matter is a particle and it talks to standard model particles, that we can draw this approximate four-particle four uh, Feynman diagram, where at the center of the diagram, we know that there has to be some weird new physics. And when we put different types of new physics in there, we can project um, what sort of signals we might see indirectly from dark matter annihilating the standard model particles, what we might see from direct detection, which is dark matter standard model scattering, and what we might see in colliders where we produce dark matter from uh, interactions between standard model particles. <laughs> so in this talk, I'm focused on the direct detection angle, which is sort of, right, that's the orthogonal direction to the other two types of searches, which means that the energy scale and the types of interactions are much different. Um, than in the forwards, backwards directions of, of annihilation or creation. Um, the promise here, obviously, is that if one type of detection sees a hint, um, we have ways that we've already you know, thought about and, and worked through to follow up on hints from other types of detection strategies. And specifically for low mass dark matter, so for dark matter um, below a GEV in mass, um, there's been a lot of work recently on, on how you go after that first couple decades of mass below the traditional boundary of uh, dark matter experiments. So um, for a bit, we were focus focusing on the traditional WIMP, which is sort of in the 100 GeV mass range or so, roughly at cross sections compatible with the weak scale. So 10 to the minus 42, 10 to the minus 43 in cross section. Um, but in this lower mass range, a couple things happen. So first of all, dark matter becomes light enough and numerous enough that we actually get different types of production scenarios in the early universe. So in some pretty simple dark sectors models where you introduce 
some sort of mediator between standard model particles and dark matter particles in a new sector that kind of looks like e electromagnetism, um, I can produce uh, dark matter directly, um, or I can have, you know, through a freeze out scenario, or I can, um, I, I can have it uh, fall out of thermal equilibrium with, with the universe. So um, in either case, I can get rough uh, estimates of what the coupling for a given dark matter mass would be based on um, what I know about um, the, the physics of the early universe and how the dark matter had to be produced in a given scenario. And I can draw expectation lines um, and talk about things like what the scattering kinematics might be. Um, and so th this is a plot, a projection plot from the Cosmic Visions Workshop, which is, I guess, nearing five years old now, showing how some of these newer experiments could go after some of these um, dark sectors uh, targets. So this is pretty ambitious. It's, it's uh, experiments with a single to multiple electron threshold level run for between uh, a gram year and a kilogram year. Um, and so you can see in some of these early projections, which are mostly background free, um, experiments like Super CDMS and Sensei, which you may have heard of, um, these are the experiments that can kind of reach this nominal freeze-in target. Um, so this is the near-term science we're going after. And what makes this really interesting is that at the cross-sections of this rel relic density target, for dark matter masses of around you know, tens of MeV, um, event rates are really large compared to what we're used to. So it's of order a hertz per kilogram. Um, whereas you know, if you look at things like LZ and Xenon, uh, or even Super CDMS Snow Lab at like 10 or 20 GeV, what we're looking for is events per year, um, per in some cases per ton, in some cases per tens of kilograms. So what's make the, what makes this really promising, especially as you go to lower and lower masses, is the event rate goes way up. You don't need nearly as much mass to probe it. Um, but the challenge is that the energy scale becomes much more difficult to probe. So um, if we take one of the assumptions from the beginning of the talk and we say, OK, I think dark matter, regardless of the mass, moves with roughly the velocity distribution of the galaxy, then even the fastest moving particles, the ones moving at the escape velocity of the galaxy, as you get below a proton mass, their, their maximum, the maximum energy they can transfer in elastic or uh, yeah, an elastic collision with um, any of these target nuclei gets very small. And so by the time you get even just to an MeV, um, in an elastic scenario um, for even helium, which is one of the lightest nuclei, we're talking about uh, milli EV scale energy deposits. Um, and one of the big developments in the field was recognizing that, okay, you know. The kinetic energy is falling, but in the electron system, you don't yet suffer from this uh, kinematic hit that you do when you're colliding with nucleons. And so electrons can get closer to an EV. But you can see that when, when we get below a GEV, um, regardless of what you do, we're talking about detectors that are much lower than the typical energy scales of, say, things like PMTs um, or scintillating crystals, things that we use, we've been using in particle physics for uh, many decades now. So regardless of what you do and, and how you probe the dark matter, what the interaction is, we're, we're talking about new technologies that can probe very low background signals at very low energy thresholds. And so the, the, the overall picture of, I would say, dark matter, broadly speaking, but really focusing on the, the sub-GEV and the sub-MEV range, is that A, um, we now know that there's pretty much a model that can accommodate any mass. Right, so there's, there's maybe some phenomenological priors on what you think dark matter should be. For example, lots of people think you know, QCD axion is now the best candidate since the vanilla wimp has sort of been ruled out. Um, but you can always come up with a theoretical scenario and you know, uh, the only real arguments against any of these are naturalness, which you, know, you can pick what you think is natural and what you, you don't based on your own priors. Um, so we have obviously some current experiments probing some of these mass ranges. Um, in particular, uh, at Fermilab, for example, we have ADMX and then Super CVMS and Sensei. Um, there's also LZ and Darkside, which are uh, LZ is you know the the US contribution to high mass. Um, there's Darkside. There's also Xenon, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there's a, a bunch of these new experiments in the dark matter New Horizons portfolio. So there's a high frequency extension ADMX. There's DM Radio, which goes to lower axion mass. There's a Scura, which is a scale up of Sensei and Domic to kilogram scale. Um, but there's a there's sort of a gap here, which is technologically um, challenging, and, and that's being filled by quantum sensing R&D. So uh, basically taking uh, devices derived from qubits or 
resonators run at very low temperatures um, and trying to read out things at the milli EV scale right around where dark matter goes from looking more wave-like to particle-like. So this is the sort of the big picture of what's going on in dark matter. And so the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus first on what we are doing in super CDMS to go after sort of EV to GEV scale dark matter. And then what we can do beyond that and what the challenges are in particular, both on the, the phenomenology side as well as the technology side to getting to really closing this gap between the, the resonator type experiments for axions and the scattering experiments we've been doing for the last couple of decades. So let's focus first on the higher energy regime. So I have a plot here zoomed in on, on the recoil kinematics um, plot that I showed earlier, just below one GeV. And you can see that there's this region down to about a milli, uh, sorry, not a milli EV, a, a big MEV that kind of bottoms out at the germanium band gap. Um, and the reason that I'm highlighting this is because what I'm going to be talking about are, are searches for dark matter with silicon and germanium, where we're really utilizing our electron recoils that produce at least one electron hole pair, um, which to do that, you need to provide energy above the band gap. Um, you can see there's a bunch of materials in there. There's also helium. Um, diamond we'll touch upon briefly at the end, as well as argon and xenon. You can see that um, in this type of a channel, the heavier elements that are used for the high mass searches actually suffer from um, a disadvantage in that they have much higher gaps and, and they will bottom out at a much higher mass. So a lot of this is being led by the silicon and germanium detectors. Um, in super CDMS, um, since I'm a detector person, I'm going to tell you a lot about detectors in this talk. So in super CDMS, um, we primarily uh, use detectors that read out heat from crystals. And in particular, um, heat produced by some interaction well above the ambient temperature of the crystal. And we try to read it out well before it sort of thermalizes um, so that it's, you know, it's an athermal signal, which has a lot more information about the position and um, type of the interaction. So the general idea of, of any event detection in the super CDMS detector is some event produces both heat and charge carriers we drift the charge carriers to the surface and we try to collect the heat at the surface before it's rattled around in the crystal too many times. Um, we realized, uh, well, it was pointed out maybe 20 years ago that if you apply a large enough bias across a crystal, you can actually make the charges rattle around a lot as they propagate from the end event position to the top of the detector. And they will produce an additional amount of heat proportional to that voltage. It's basically just, this is a resistor. If I put V across it and I have I through it, then I get a power times V. Um, but we didn't actually show this at the single electron level until 2017. So this was a paper by an undergrad at Stanford that I was mentoring at the time. Um, this was also part of my thesis work. So to understand this, we ran this one detector. We just look at a noise blob. So if we process the detector at known event points, we just look at the width of the zero peak with nothing in there. We can then pulse about 30 photons on the detector still at zero volts, and we get the, the dashed curve, which moves to about 60 EV, since each of the photons has two EV of energy. Um, and then if we dial down the laser so that only a couple photons at the detector at a time, and we apply some uh, non-trivial bias of about 50 volts, then we start to see individual photon peaks corresponding to uh, individual electron hole pairs at one, two, and three electron hole pairs. And if I triple the voltage, I can move the initial single electron peak from 50 EV to 150 EV. Um, so this was the first demonstration of this effect at the single electron level. We had used this in the past in the form of CDMS light to do dark matter results as well. Um, but when you start to see single electrons, there's a lot more science you could do, which is very interesting. So 60 EV, 50 EV, 150 EV. Um, and not to get too much into the weeds, uh, I, this is my only slide on this, but one of the ways we've been improving these detectors is to really understand all the microphysics of heat collection um, and optimize the sensors on the surface of the detectors to collect heat very quickly before any of it gets lost or reabsorbed by the crystal um, and get it to our sensors as fast as possible. So the meat of my research in particular is understanding this structure and how we propagate energy from the crystal into the, the devices. Um, the TLDR for this slide though is um, based on what we know about the physics, the efficiency is limited to about 30%. And you know, on the device R&D side, we're basically um, meeting those fundamental quantum efficiencies. Um, and so we, we have a much more mature device that we think we understand very well now. Um, the devices we run currently, we're repeatedly achieving roughly two and a half EV resolution. So these are devices that I designed uh, at Fermilab. Um, we can see really sharp laser peaks 
peaks. Um, we've been studying a lot of the fill in between peaks, which is caused by partial charge collection or um, events with additional heat in addition to the charge production. And um, there's been a lot of R&D on all aspects of running the detector, including um, running in a continuous mode where we run an offline trigger and we're able to continuously do about three sigma triggering with very uh, high efficiency, even uh, down to about 15 EV in, in absolute event energy. And as far as I know, um, this is still the world record both for phonon resolution and a macroscopic detector and uh, energy threshold. Um, so that's, that's a, this is a result we put out at the end of last year. So what are we doing in terms of, of physics, uh, physics results? So when I, uh, when I was defending my PhD, which uh, was actually not that long ago, um, we all had our first results up. So um, the left-hand side result is the spectrum we observed from the HVV detector, the first one uh, at Stanford. Top right was the first Sensei result. And then um, in, the, in the middle there is the Xenon 10 result, which is actually from uh, about a decade ago now. So that, that was the only result in this, in this uh, space for a long time. Um, both both uh, CDMS and Sensei, which are both silicon, we saw very high leakage rates we didn't understand. Um, and in the interim, we both put out a bunch of results. Um, the current state of the art, Sensei is now leaving the field. Um, it's, it's a great experiment. I, I, I've worked closely with a lot of those people since they're also at Fermi Lab. Um, and they really pushed on understanding the sources of charge leakage um, and reducing them, which in CCDs, since you know, it's, it's a very well-established technology, there are a lot of resources for doing that. In CDMS, um, since we are really using this brand new technology, we've learned a lot about it. But one of the surprises is, you know, we've done a couple of mitigations um, at the surface for detectors, and we actually found, despite much higher resolution, event rates that were very similar to what we saw in our first run. Uh, in, in addition, other experiments have come online, including Edelweiss, which are the germanium detectors, um, and they see similar things. You know, they, they're seeing some charge leakage, they're seeing some excess events, um, and we've had a, we've had a real challenge. Um, understanding the backgrounds. Um, so this was the result of the second run, which was done at Northwestern in 20, I guess the data was taken in 2019. Um, we saw basically what we what were real signals um, that didn't vary with detector type and event position. Um, and what has happened in this field recently is, is really starting to understand the background processes rele relevant to an event uh, to, a, to a detector with EV scale resolution running at really low backgrounds. So one of the most uh, important contributions to the field recently is this paper I cite in the bottom right here. Um, this was Ruben Essig's group out of Stony Brook. They actually showed that you can completely explain both the Sensei and CDMS backgrounds above one electron hole pair by um, Cherenkov radiation from materials around the detector. The way to think of this, it's a, it's a pretty cool tertiary background. You have a high energy particle, which is incident on some material that is not the detector that produces some quasi-stable quasi states that decay into UV photons that then hit your detector. And it, it manifests itself very differently in HVV and Sensei. We're both seeing it. Um, and what we've been doing in the last two years is we've moved our detector underground. This is a picture of me and um, Ziching, who was a, at the time was a postdoc at Northwestern. He's now new faculty at Toronto. Uh, he'll be up at, at Snow Lab a lot with you guys. So um, some of you, I'm sure, have met him or will soon. Um, we ran the run two detector there, saw similar performance. Um, and we actually just finished up a science run early this year <clears throat> with the payload in the middle here. Um, both of those detectors, the, the two good science grade detectors, achieving three EV resolution, 10 EV thresholds, single electron resolution, <clears throat> and um, run in this mode one detector can veto events for all of the adjacent detectors. So we're studying things like Cherenkov backgrounds um, and multiples hits. Um, and this, this, this result, uh, we got about 40 grand days of exposure. <clears throat> the results should come out, I'm hoping in the next couple months, the results are really nice. Um, we expect to at least match Sensei based on what we're seeing so far, if not exceed them slightly. And we have a, a fourth run planned uh, in Nexus, which is the, the shallow site at Fermilab um for the end of this year so we're very excited about this we're really understanding the backgrounds um and i think that the really long-term promise of all of this is that you know this is this is supposed to be an upgrade to super cdms snow lab so you know this being a snow lab seminar you guys know we have a, a site underground there i haven't talked a lot about the nuclear recoil results um but 
all of the small device testing is really helping us understand how to run the, 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 the detectors we're starting to fabricate and send up to Snow Lab. We have that nice cryo set up there. The idea is once we get the initial results from Super CMS Snow Lab by 2025, 2026, that we can have large towers of devices derived from these designs that can go in and push to much lower masses, um, either to go after the neutrino floor um, or to go after much, much lower dark matter mass. So this is, in the, this is the official Snow Lab plan. Um, there's a couple of different ways we go after it. Um, I just talked about sort of HPV successors. I'll talk a little bit later in the talk about multiplexed arrays of very low threshold detectors. Um, I won't talk much about charge R&D stuff, but these are sort of the three things we're pushing on in super CDMS in terms of R&D for beyond super CDMS Snow Lab dark matter results. <clears throat> so this is what we're doing now. And um, you know, I, I, I'm assuming many of you have uh, seen, those of you who aren't in super CDMS have seen what super CDMS Snow Lab will do talks. And so I'm not gonna focus too much on that. Um, but I wanna spend the rest of the talk um, sort of thinking about what we do for the next mass regime. What are the challenges? What, you know, what are the similarities and differences between the scattering experiments we've been doing up to this date um, and the sort of weirder lower mass dark matter candidates that we have to go after if we don't see anything but in the sort of MEV to GEV and EV to KEV regimes. So you can see that this is all subgap in most materials we know of. However, um, there's another class of materials, namely superconductors. You can include superfluids as part of the same class of materials, which have much smaller gaps. And so these are things where at zeroth order, the interatomic um, attraction does not give rise to some sort of uh, band gap, but some correction, be it spin, be it long-term correlation, uh, gives rise to a much smaller scale gap, which again, you can utilize to differentiate between thermal population of states and a thermal population of states and read out um, disequilibrium events or scattering events. <clears throat> so it turns out this is a pretty interesting uh, condensed matter problem. So if you go and you open a, um, an atomic scattering textbook and you start to go redo all of your intro physics classes and talk about things like Compton scattering and core scattering and valence scattering, you realize, okay, well, there's a lot more going on in there and we don't typically dig into it because it's not really relevant for anything above, say, about an EV and energy. So, you know, classical physics, we don't care about this stuff. Uh, nuclear physics cares about this stuff, but only very specific context. And so um, when you look at uh, one of these, these plots of what's called the, the scale, uh, the dynamic structure factor, which gives you the relative scattering rate as a function of energy, you see other features like plasmons, phonons, which I've talked about, as well as quasi-elastic and elastic scattering. Um, what's not shown in this diagram is that this is actually not a monotonic function. So when you get down to energy transfers below, say, an EV or so, um, you do actually have to think of everything as wave-by-wave -wave scattering with both momentum and energy dependence. And then you also have to really carefully consider what happens in the band structure very, very close to all of these gaps. So <clears throat> dark matter scattering is no longer something you can think of as free to free scattering, it really, really depends on what's going on with all of the bound states in the system. So let's, let's, let's illustrate this a bit. And this is all based on a paper we put out earlier this year, um, talking about something called the dielectric function, which is related to the structure factor. So if I make a two dimensional plot of uh, energy on the y axis and momentum on the x axis, and I think about which parts of this scattering region can be populated by dark matter, um, I see this ellipse. So if I can find a material that allows me to scatter into a state with a given Q and omega in this ellipse, then a scattering event can occur. And the relative frequency of states in that ellipse, uh, or sorry, in the shaded region, tells me a bit about the, the frequency of scattering within the region. So um, on the downslope, that's forward scattering. At the peak, it's stopping the dark matter. And on the edge, it's essentially the dark matter bouncing off of whatever the target is. And so now we're not assuming that um, we have free particles because, for example, for this mass of dark matter, if I have elastic scattering, um, this, is, this is something that is solidly below the band gap. So if I just thought about scattering to a free electron or a free nucleus, um, A, that lives on this line in Q versus omega because it has a fixed uh, dispersion relation when it's a free particle. And B, 
you know, I, I'm, I'm concluding from here because I'm not including any of the, the um, collective states that there is no scattering, which is actually not true. So um, there's been a lot of work, I'd say maybe in the last decade into single phonon scattering. And so this, that lives in this box here where um, you perturb the system only a little bit so that it's a linear perturbation. You get a single phonon out, either acoustic or optical, and you can calculate the rate from um, something really close to, you know, like the lattice approximation. It's a very mean field sort of physics. Um, and then there's this highly inelastic regime. And this is, I think, the hardest, but also the most interesting regime to calculate because it's properly multi-phonon. So you can't, you can't think of what you produce as a single wave or a single particle, but it's some sort of combination of particles and waves that's not properly localized. Um, this is sort of the, it's, it's, it's sort of a divergence regime if you're used to the, the particle physics analogies, but it's also an interesting regime. And then finally, there's a collective regime. And so you can see that the inelastic regime sort of looks like a continuation of the elastic regime and the phonon regime lives at the bottom of that line. This, this inelastic regime is, is well above it. So it's uh, coherent modes that allow for scattering in a place where you wouldn't expect it to be. And that I think is one of the most interesting uh, regimes for future dark matter experiments. So in this paper, what we did is we looked at, if I took some arbitrary dynamic structure factor, how do I calculate dark matter scattering rates? And then um, what properties of the material might make it a good candidate for dark matter scattering? So if I, if I draw an analogy to say Compton scattering, um, this upper scattering rate expression is actually the, the, the Compton scattering rate extended down to zero energy and momentum. It has the dynamic structure factor. It has a coupling term, which goes as the Bohr radius and product of electron spins in the ratio of the scattering energies. For dark matter, I have a similar thing, but now it's just a form factor. So if I think of the, um, the coupling in front of the Compton scattering as the Compton form factor, I have a dark matter form factor, which is determined by whatever my dark matter um, model is. And then I have the other object, which is the dynamic structure factor. Um, and in another language that's actually related to the dielectric function of the material. So loss functions themselves, that's a really rich field in condensed matter physics. Um, and it leads to things like in the upper right plot where I have the same dark matter shaded regions. And now I can project all of the collective modes into those regions. And I find I actually have a much broader region of scattering space than I thought because of things like plasmons, which are coherent oscillations in the electron system, and loss of those plasmon lines, which bleed down into uh, an additional regime of the material. And if I use this new formulation for dark matter, I can come up with interesting new materials that can probe dark matter down to an MeV and, and in some cases down to a milliEV. So there we're showing um, aluminum in the superconducting state, uh, uranium ruthenium silicon too, which is a magnetically ordered material and has a very low plasmon energy relative to like most materials, and uh, direct material, which is something sort of a hypothetical 2D material with a weird dispersion relation. So this is all sort of like looking for weird materials that condensed matter physicists want to study and figuring out how they can couple to dark matter um, in ways that allow us to probe into this wave-like regime um, of dark matter above the, the point at which we can really treat the dark matter as a fluid like is done in the axion experiments. So if you didn't follow most of that, um, what you should just focus on is that essentially below uh, one MeV or about 10 MeV and below an EV in, in, in uh, recoil energy, things are very collective and you actually have to go look at the band structure and the collective modes of the material to see what is good for different types of searches. Um, there was a great paper out at the end of 2019, which did this for a lot of models at the time. Um, and there's sort of rehashes of this with this new formalism, doing this in a more generic way. But um, the, the key materials here for dark matter searches going forward are not the same ones we've been using. So in particular, there are things with low gaps like indium antimonide, which is actually a class, uh, it's a classical semiconductor, but one with a very small gap. And then materials with very strong modes. And in particular, diamond and silicon carbide, which have very tight interatomic bonds, have really nice phonons, have a lot of collective modes. These are, these are things that um, are very good for probing some of these models at much lower dark matter masses. So uh, in particular, if we look at dark matter nucleon search couplings for different thresholds, 
um, down to a KV. Um, what, one interesting thing you can see here, if I pull it out, is that if I run diamond compared to any other material, I get about a two order of magnitude jump in the relative reach of that material versus any other material, just because it has a very high energy phonon. And when the phonon comes in, you have this inelastic mode, um, which gives you scattering in a regime that you can't access if you're not down to the phonon energy. And so this gives us a, a really interesting way to jump start the search for dark matter down to one MeV if we can get detectors with single phonon sensitivity. So 100 milliEV, if I compare it to the detectors I was showing earlier, it's about almost two orders of magnitude in threshold from where we are now. Um, but that's you know one of the big R&D directions we're pursuing is phonon, phonon sensitivity down to the 100 milliEV target um, with the hopes of starting to open up this window a bit more. You can see other materials um, that are probed there. So gallium arsenide is one that's been proposed a bunch. Calcium fluoride, which is, um, uh, I believe, a scintillator, um, and, and other such materials. We've also been looking at silicon carbide. Um, and one interesting property of this detector is, you know, A, it has just as good sensitivity as any other of these proposed materials, including gallium arsenide and superfluid helium. Um, but because of its weird structure and its many different polytypes, so you can take the same crystal chemistry and make many different types and shapes of crystal, um, you expect dark matter to modulate its rate over the course of a day in very different ways depending on the crystal structure. So um, this and this effect gets more enhanced at low mass. So you can, you can imagine as you go to these new materials, if you can make new detectors and new materials with much lower thresholds, you can start to see modulation within the course of a day. You don't need that much material to probe that modulation. And you, know, you can have a couple different detectors made of different materials and the, the character of the modulation will change in a way that's unique for dark matter compared to any other process. So this is similar in some sense to annual modulation. However, the time scale is much shorter and um, many different types of tests can be run within a few years, say, um, to really determine whether you're seeing some environmental effect or if you're just seeing, uh, or if you're really seeing a dark matter signal. So um, because I'm a detector physicist, I, I've done a bit of uh, speculation as to you know, where we can go from where we are now um, in, in you know, the near future and then into the far long term and how we can do that. So there's a bunch of stuff obviously going on within the dark matter field. I've listed some things that I'm aware of, um, sort of biased towards what I'm working on because that's what I'm most aware of. However, um, in these two papers, what we did was we said, if we were, for example, to take a diamond and instrument it um, with a TES, for example, uh, so the super CDMS technology, how could we achieve resolutions low enough to start to probe single, single phonons? Um, and there's a roadmap there for it. And this is something that's being worked on actively both at uh, Slack and Berkeley. Um, and for silicon carbide, we took a slightly different approach, which kind of leads into my next point of saying, let's, let's forget about a specific detector technology. Let's take what we know about collecting phonons and see how different sensors might perform as uh, phonon detectors if we could couple the phonons efficiently into them as we can for TESs. And one of the big things that jumps out here in the bottom right is that as I go from blue to red, which is sort of the least aggressive assumption to most aggressive assumption, um, I do actually find technologies that can match some of these, these uh, performance targets. But as I go down to lower and lower resolutions, what I'm finding is the state of the art is actually dominated not by things we've been working on largely in uh, particle physics, but in things that are derived from qubits. And, and so there are sensors that we have gotten um, as a result of collaboration with the quantum sensing community, such as QCDs, which are quantum capacitance detectors, essentially just a qubit run in a different way, as well as um, SNS junctions, which again um, are studied for their, their Josephson oscillation properties. So, um, so I guess like what I've seen going through this whole process of what are we looking for, how do we look for it, and what do we need to look for it, is that one of the most promising ways to get to this, this sub-MEV regime, so the ultimate um, detector with milli-EV scale sensitivity, is to start to really partner strongly with quantum sensing R&D um, and take advantage of some of these new technologies, which are frankly, you know, orders of magnitude ahead of us in terms of their, their heat sensitivity. So um, 
this, this sort of leads to some of the research programs that I've gotten involved in and, and I think are really exciting. Um, and so I'm going to focus on, you know, what I've been looking at because I'm, I've been at Fermilab and um, there's a bunch of people there that are very excited about this, but I think this is sort of reflective of a broader trend, especially for people who do detector R&D. Um, I'm happy to talk more about things I've I've learned even since putting this talk together. Um, I think it's a very vibrant community. So the, the three things that, that, that I've found interesting that I've started to work on are, are sort of filling the gap between super CDMS and ADMX. So the three problems are essentially, how do you extend our cavity experiment to higher frequency? How do you detect terahertz photons, which are sort of photons in this perfect regime between particle-like and wave-like light? And then how do you develop resonators which can uh, overcome TESs and get to much lower thresholds um, and, and take advantage of a lot of the readout R&D done for QIS systems. Um, so Fermilab, one of my main uh, projects was actually this, this Kids for Dark Matter project in conjunction with uh, Caltech. So the idea of a, of a KID, kinetic inductance detector, is that you have a, a detector unit which changes its inductance as a function of the number of quasi-particles broken in the device. So essentially, the, the um, inductance is a function of the heat being absorbed. And so if you put it in a resonant LC circuit and you monitor the resonance frequency, you can see a frequency shift, which is coincident with a heat event. So what I'm showing on the left is sort of an example device. Um, the bottom left is, is the design for our current dark matter device with a single primarily sensitive kid made of aluminum at the center. Um, and then if you inject a bunch of heat into one of the adjacent resonators and you read out the target resonator, um, you can actually see a pulse, which looks very similar to any other um, particle physics technology. Um, the benefits of this are, can be read out, with, read out with a single feed line. You can put many devices on a single feed line and get many, many sensors for you know, a single coax line. And again, you know, we can run at a higher frequencies where we can take advantage of some of the more cutting edge amplifier designs that are being used to read out qubits. So this is, uh, this is a fairly, I mean, it's not a new project. Caltech has been working on it um, pretty much by themselves for about 10 years, but in the last three or four years, both Fermilab and LBL have gotten into the game with them um, funding this, this project because it is so synergistic with quantum information. And because we're finally getting amplifiers that can really utilize the, 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 the ultimate sensitivity of these types of sensors. So we've been running it um, in a DR. We're seeing, you know, muon pulses, which is any, any experimentalist will tell you, if you can't see muons, you can't see anything. So, um, and we're starting to run it at Nexus. We have a device underground at Nexus uh, re ready for a, a science run, which we hope to take in the next year with these devices. We're targeting a resolution of around three to five EV. So it should be comparable to what we can do with HVV. Um, and the hope is that as we start to add more advanced quantum amplifiers, it will quickly surpass um, what TSs can do. Um, it's a pretty rich device. Uh, I, I don't want to get too much into it, but there's a lot of cool microphysics that can be probed with these devices. Um, so I've just I've enjoyed, especially during the pandemic, digging back into my superconductor literature and understanding. Um, trends of, you know, uh, internal Q and, and resonant frequency with, with temperature and power. So it's been pretty fun. Um, one of the major projects we undertook here, which might be relevant for those of you thinking about long-term plans for cryostats and snow lab, for example, is we just went through the process of upgrading a DC fridge for RF. So um, this was actually designed both to run a kid device as well as a qubit. Um, we've now uh, run all these coax lines. We have a bunch of hemp amplifiers in there. We have one of these tupas, which is a para amp that runs at, at 10 millikelvin. Um, it was not super trivial, but it, it was a good exercise to understand the pros and cons of RF versus DC readout. Um, and most recently, we just concluded a run at Nexus where we, uh, we operated a qubit. We started doing some qubit spectroscopy. We operated the kid. Uh, we have it coupled to a laser. Um, uh, a fiber, uh, a laser, a fiber coupled laser. Um, and we're starting to actually do a lot of the same science now um, in an underground facility that's shielded. Um, not quite snow lab class, but somewhere between a surface facility and the snow lab class facility. Um, 
so this is still sort of when I'm talking about kids, I'm still kind of talking about scattering experiments. So one of the most interesting things I think that has come out of some of these exercises is recognizing that um, in this milli EV to EV regime, especially for axion searches, it's a very untapped range. So this is um, sort of 100 gigahertz to 10 terahertz in photon frequency which corresponds to roughly 0.3 milli EV to a tenth of an EV. Um, and uh, the, the, the challenge and promise here is that if you can run a modest size detector, so something on the same scale as an ADMX type experiment in a 10 Tesla magnet for a day, uh, if you can achieve photon per day background rates, you can basically sweep out a much broader space in this field. So um, rather than doing narrow band resonator experiments, you can do a broadband experiment, mostly limited by things like the quantum efficiency of your detector. So um, this is the region we go after. You can see that um, as you get to higher masses, you know, you stop, you kind of lose sensitivity at this level to the typical axion targets. But um, this is a pretty, you know, it's an interesting thing to go after. It's technologically interesting. And you can actually design a pretty um, classical experiment in terms of things uh, that have been done for axions, um, but couple it to a different type of sensor and, and really do a, a new type of search. So we, we submitted an LOI for this to the SOMAS process. We're working on a sensitivity plot, uh, so a sensitivity paper. But the general, general idea of this experiment um, looks very similar to a cavity experiment where you have an antenna and a B field, um, but instead of um, collecting uh, resonant photons at a certain frequency, you rely on photoconversion at the walls of this cryostat, which reflect off this reflector to a focal point. And at the focal point, you put some terahertz uh, sensitive device that you've calibrated in some other cryostat to do a dark matter search. So I think what I like about this experiment is A, I get to go fun, you know, terahertz photon detectors, which I just think is fundamentally a, a cool thing to work on. But also this is, this is a dark matter experiment that could operate more like a telescope experiment where someone develops a reflector and associated infrastructure and different groups working on different types of sensors can come put their sensor to the ultimate test on the, on the telescope and at the same time do a bunch of complementary dark, dark matter searches. So this is something that uh, Andrew Sonnenschein has been spearheading at Fermilab. I'm, I'm taking my involvement to Slack with me. And this is a cool growing program that I imagine eventually would need to be cited at, for example, an underground facility where um, cosmic rays and, and, and background radioactivity are um, taken care of. Uh, there's also some just kind of cool pure physics experiments, understanding terahertz optical paths that it's been fun to do on a lab bench. So um, that's one of my students, Kristen at uh, UChicago, comparing some of her own filter spectra to what we expect, for example, plastic bags to look like. And um, understanding, you know, how you propagate terahertz rays that don't like to behave um, as waves or particles. So um, in conclusion, you know, I've talked about a lot of things here. Um, Nexus, which is this underground facility at Fermilab, um, Nexus is being asked to do a lot of things. We've expanded it as part of the Quantum Science Center with another fridge, but we're running these TS-based searches as part of SuperCDMS. We're doing kid-based detectors. Um, Hopefully, with sub, -millique, sub 100 millikay noise temperature quantum amplifiers to do dark matter searches. And we're also doing quantum information science in one facility with all the same infrastructure um, in a really nice synergistic way. And we've ended up you know, involving, I would say, 10 research groups, uh, about half from Super CDMS and half from other collaborations funded by uh, quantum information money. Um, I'm looking at ways to expand this type of capability elsewhere. I'd love to see something at Snow Lab like this. Um, it's something I maybe maybe uh, we can talk about offline um, with anyone who's interested in learning more about what could be done um, in a Snow Lab class facility with, with uh, a lot of this cutting edge RF technology. But I think, you know, in general, broader conclusions are um, the electron recoil stuff, this is really maturing. So HPV and Sensei are hopefully going to be leapfrogging for a couple more years. Um, a, pre, uh, a successor to Sensei is funded, Super CDMS. We're making good strides in making sure Snow Lab is also competitive in this space. Um, I'm excited going forward about the synergy between quantum information and low mass dark matter. Um, and I think 
you know, very long term, what I'm thinking about is how do you detect, study, and control milliEV scale excitations? And I think I think the application there is very broad beyond dark matter and QIS. Uh, again, beyond the scale of this talk, but my wife being a doctor, I'm also interested in the uh, non-ionizing radiation for uh, medical imaging and terror is something that that field is also very interested in. So um, in any case, it's a, it's, a, it's a rambling talk with a lot of stuff in here. There's a ton of people I've collaborated with. It's a very vibrant, rich field. Um, so uh, we have a lot of fun. Uh, we, we also work underground. We're not quite as clean as you can see from the photo, but um, clean-ish. Um, but uh, yeah, so thanks for listening. I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you so much, Noah. Very nice talk and very uh, a lot of information. Uh, I see Chris has a question. So please, Chris, go ahead. Uh, thanks for a very nice talk. Um, I admit I am very naive in this sort of quantum sensing field. So you'll know how much I understood from this question. Going back to this diamond phonon sensors where you try to detect a single phonon in, in diamond. Is it something about the electrical or the um, crystal properties of diamond or is it the fact that you can make diamonds very regular without um, contamination to scatter or absorb the phonons, which is what makes diamonds so good, or some combination of the two. Um, yeah, so you're talking about about this this grid. Yeah. So it's it's kind of a combination of the two. So like from a condensed matter perspective, the orbitals in carbon are much simpler. Um, so there are fewer degrees of freedom that could potentially lead to phonon decay. And because carbon carbon bonds are like the strongest bonds pretty much that we know of. Um, the interatomic spacing is very small. Um, so what that leads to, you know, it's a high elasticity constant, which is also what makes um, diamond so hard and a really small spacing, which means that these like these optical waves just have a really high frequency. So I think diamond, diamond is the highest optical phonon energy that I know of, very closely followed by silicon carbide because silicon looks very carbon-like. Um, right. So that's that's the big deal. And and so to be fair to everyone who's come before us, um, you can go look at the literature on diamond and people have known that it's got these really nice properties for a long time. And I think one of the things that's changing that I'm excited about is the um, is industry is actually making uh, quantum and optical grade diamond in a fairly affordable way now. So we're finally able to get our hands on it. There's groups doing um, diamond beam monitors for the high, lo high lumen upgrade. There's a bunch of us looking at it for dark matter. There's people using it for quantum storage because of other vacancy properties. So um, it, it's it's actually kind of realistic that we we're going to use this for um, dark matter. Right. Way back when I had a stack Matt prof who said that uh, jewelry is a terrible waste of a good diamond. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the my my favorite. My favorite story is about the Harvard Black Diamonds, which is all these studies done with a bag of diamonds that someone at Harvard got from one of their Russian friends. Um, and that's like, if you find, if you go back and look at the literature, all the best studies were done with them. There are all these natural diamonds with high nitrogen content that have basically never been repeated until recently. So um, it's a really nice material that we also as humans find really shiny and attractive. And that's made it kind of hard to use it for science until recently. Does this uh, answer your question, Chris? Okay. Are there any other questions, comments for Noah? No? Can you go back to this slide where you presented the, um, I don't remember if it was before this, but the exclusion limit uh, with the different crystal. Yeah, in one? here. Yeah, I, yeah. I might have missed. So, what is the green, uh, uh, not dashed, but small dashed line? Um, so I, I, I'm just curious about the kink that I'm seeing there because it's the oh, only one that kink? show the kink there. So I was yeah, just so a that's, curiosity. That's aluminum nitride. And my guess is that 
that's more of a two dimensional material than anything else here. So, so but it, it doesn't think, show the, the the same kink when you go down, right? When yeah, yeah. So, so, so I'm not curious. entirely sure. This is from this this review paper that looked at I think like thirty oh. different materials. I, I'm not entirely sure what that is. My guess is there's multiple optical phonons. Uh, and and the coupling to this optical mode is stronger than the coupling to this optical mode. That would be my guess. Ah, uh, so you have a a swap. I mean, you you change a parameter kind of um, like a yeah yeah. Um, this might be like a resonance where you're very sensitive interest, yeah. to one to one mode, but only around a certain energy scale. Oh, okay. um, but you can see, yeah, I mean, none of the other crystals, which are all more three D, have that sort of a kink. Um, this is a very, if, if you're interested in this stuff, this is a great paper. It has a, a theory um, a companion paper, but this one is the experimental one where they look at, for a couple of these sort of simplified models, uh, how different materials perform. And they do all of the, the DFT to get the band structure. And they talk about the, the phonon structure as well with the different code. Um, okay. So I really like it. It's great. They did the, the, the field of great service with that paper. Okay, thanks. Um... Uh, any other question or comment? If uh, not, I would like to thank Snow again. Thank you very much. And if you yeah, could uh, me. send me the slide, it will be appreciated by the people that couldn't join the, the seminar today. Yeah, no problem. Okay, great. Thank you so much and have a good day, all. Bye. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.